Hi everybody, I am Sarah Cray and I teach watercolor and sometimes gouache and today we are doing our jack-o'-lantern tutorial. Oh. We have Michael here working the cameras. Hello. And I'm super excited for this project because um, one, it's gouache. I love painting with gouache. And two, I'm going to show you how you don't have to have exact true colors, um, but instead how the power of value can still communicate what we're trying to communicate. Okay? Love it. So we will be doing this project in six steps. So our very first step is we will be painting the background with putting a hint of a ground in there. Our second step is we'll be painting uh, the reflection and kind of like a hint of a light source in the background. Our third step is we'll be painting the carved portions of our pumpkin. Our fourth step is we will paint our pumpkin. This is essentially just laying down a bunch of colors and um, kind of playing with textures and value shifts. Our fifth step is we will put in our stem and then we will do another layer across our pumpkin, blending things out. Our sixth step is going back and kind of tightening up our carvings or doing any kind of last minute details that we need to do before we're done. Okay? Piece of cake. I'm using four um, paint brushes for this. Round two, round six, round 12, one inch wash. Please use whatever brushes you have. You don't have to have these exact brushes. Now the gouache that I'm using is the um, Holbein gouache, which is an excellent brand for gouache. And we are using six colors in this. <laughs> so let me get them all out here. Um, so our first color is ivory white. Our second color, oh no, 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 I'm sorry. Our first color is ivory black. Our second color is permanent white. Our third color is brilliant orange. Our fourth color is yellow ochre. Our fifth color is violet. And our last color is turquoise blue. Okay. I feel like they were trying to trick us by calling it ivory black. <laughs> you know? What's your game here? Come on, gouache people. <laughs> um, and if you are unfamiliar with gouache, I have an entire video that is dedicated to how gouache is similar and different from watercolor and acrylic paint. Um, it's called Intro to Gouache on our YouTube channel. So please feel free to reference that if you need a little background information before we start. The most important thing you need to know is gouache is opaque. You can layer it, which means that you can paint the entire background and hate it and start all over again. And it doesn't matter because you can layer it. Isn't that great? <laughs> yep. That's why I love it. It's just like no stress because whatever mistakes you make, you can just paint on top and cover them up. It's wonderful. It's perfect. Okay. Let us do our oath and then we will get into painting. So if you can raise your right hand and repeat after me, I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. I promise to have fun. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So here we go. I got my one inch wash because I'm covering a lot of space on my paper. And sometimes people ask me, how do you know what size brush you should use for what? It totally depends on the size that you're painting. So because we are painting the whole background, essentially, we want a bigger brush because it would take like three times as long with this size brush. You see? That makes sense. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and just grab some ivory black. And I'm going to make sure all of my things are taped down. I've already transferred my outline. Um, so hopefully you guys did too. You just want to be careful with your outline because we are using gouache and gouache will cover. If your gouache covers your outline, it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> You'll never be able to see it again. So just, you know, try and work around the outline as much as you can. And you can see that I am grabbing a little bit of water and that's mostly because that will make the paint like thin out a little bit and just make it easier to move across my paper. You'll see as my brush dries that my marks become, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Come on, Michael. Hidden? Nope, nope. Opposite of that? Nope. <laughs> I don't no, know what we're going for close. here. I don't know what we're going for. See how it's skippy? Oh, yeah. And it's not smooth? Yeah, skippy. Skippy. <laughs> <laughs> textured. Okay, maybe textured. Yeah, texture is a good word. Non-solid. Non-smooth. I'm, I'm getting rough. worse. It's getting worse. Rough. <laughs> they get rough. Rough? 
Bark. Bark, bark. <laughs> okay. So just keep on going. I am covering. If you want to work around this kind of light, the outline here that I have here, you can. I feel fine covering mine up um, because I know I've done, I did this painting. <laughs> but if you want to kind of work around it, that's fine too. What about sparse? No. Dried out? Maybe. <laughs> keep going and I'm just going to keep shutting you down. I got a question for you. Okay. The pumpkin. Yeah. Fruit or vegetable? Pumpkin is a fruit. How do you know? Seeds. Seeds. Here's a little fun fact for you viewers at home. Uh, if you don't know, I went to school for biology, so I love living things. A vegetable is not a real botanical term. Talk more about that. Well, a fruit is something that happens when a flower gets pollinated and seeds mature and it's the act of reproduction for a plant. So most of the things that you eat off a plant are fruits. That's what the whole confusing, like, a tomato is actually a fruit. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it comes from a flower. Mm -hmm. Vegetable is not a botanical term. Vegetable is just a culinary term. And oh. it means something that comes from the body of a plant. Like, uh, celery is a vegetable because, like, it's not the flower of anything. It's not the product of a flower. Potato, I mean, you could argue it's a tuber or, you know, like uh -huh. some form of fat storage, but technically, I guess, vegetable. Interesting. So if it comes from a flower, fruit. If it doesn't, vegetable. So pumpkins have flowers? Yeah, they're, they're actually edible. They're like a are very they? beautiful orange, delicate flower. Pumpkins oh. are a squash. Oh, okay, okay. So when you get around the edge of the pumpkin, when it's round and we're using a one inch bra brush, it's sometimes hard to get that curve. So sometimes I'll actually hold my brush straight up and down vertically, and I'm just able to kind of curve a little bit easier than if my brush were flat against the paper, if that makes any sense. Now remember, if you go inside your pumpkin a little bit, that's okay, because the orange that we're gonna do will layer on top. I've asked this in previous gouache tutorials, but uh, we're gonna reiterate for people. Okay. Why do you go dark to light with gouache instead of light to dark? Because whenever, so whenever you're using any kind of paint medium besides watercolor, you go dark to light. Oh. And that's because you want to layer your values on top. Now, watercolor is different because it's transparent, and so you have to go light to dark. Um, and that's why watercolor is sometimes difficult for people who have experienced painting because you have to completely switch your brain on how you approach a painting. And the reason why you go dark to light is because you can layer. So you usually, in general, when you're highlighting an object, a three-dimensional object, things that are lighter in value, like let's say you're trying to paint my face. My nose, the tip of my nose, should be one of the most highlighted things because it is the thing that is closest to you. It's sticking out of my face the most. And so then you paint the face and then you start putting in the highlights and then you kind of like build that form from there and then you won't have any white gaps. Mm -hmm. If you start with the highlight and then try and add from there, it's possible that you'll have like these white spaces or maybe like how you paint it, the layering won't communicate that form as well. Um, but when you build layers on top, that's actually true to how we see form in real life. It's built upon what we see. Gotcha. Okay, so now when you get to kind of the bottom of your page, we want to get a hint of like a ground, but not like crazy, beautiful, highlighted table. I just want a little hint. So I'm going to take a little bit of my brilliant orange and mix that in with my black. And that's going to make a really pretty brown because brown is essentially dark orange. If you did not know that. And I'm just going to do a hint of brown underneath here. Now, something you need to know about gouache is that it dries really, really quick. That's something that I like about it, actually, is it dries really quick, which means that some of these areas look different in value because some of them are still wet and some are still are, are dry. And when they dry, everything always lightens when it dries. So um, there's gonna be some areas that look uneven, but just trust. You told me years ago, filming one of these tutorials, that brown was dark orange, and that blew my mind. Yes. It's funny, and we ended up talking about, it's funny that we don't give names to other dark colors. Like, dark blue is just called dark blue, essentially. Mm -hmm. But, like, yes. dark orange is brown, and that's funny. 
It is funny. So right around here, my stem, I'm actually gonna switch to my six because this is like a really tight area and it would be hard for me to like navigate that cleanly with a one inch wash. And I'm just switching to a smaller brush just for this portion. And you're allowed to do that just so you guys know. And if you're wondering if this, again, if this is one of your first times with gouache and you're like, I only have watercolor brushes, are they safe to use with gouache? Absolutely. Yes, just make sure you rinse them well because gouache is still considered a watercolor. It's an opaque watercolor and it uses the same binder and it's water soluble. So you can use your paintbrushes. If you do a lot of like delicate watercolors and gouache, it might be worth it to invest in two different sets, but it's not necessary. Okay. I've never heard delicate watercolor. Oh, the painting itself, like light. Yeah. Okay, I thought you meant- Where like the shape of, you want the shape of your brush. Like I would say like simple, where you really see that brush stroke. I don't know, you do really fine detail lines. You wanna make sure that your brushes are healthy for those types of things. It makes sense. I thought you were just talking about the paint, like you buy a very expensive, delicate watercolor. No. <laughs> okay, so that was the first step. Now we're gonna put in the second step and we're gonna put in just a hint of light back here and then the reflection that the glow of inside the jack-o'-lantern is casting on the table. Um, the reason why I put a light source back here is because I just wanted to activate this space because I put my pumpkin off to the side and right, not right in the middle. I kind of have this big empty area. And so for me, I was just like, well, I, there needs to be something there. But that was completely an artistic choice on my part and not necessary. If you're just like, I don't want that. I just want it to be pure black. That's okay. Do that. So basically I'm going to take this brilliant orange, mix it with a little bit of black so it's brown. And I'm going to start putting that in on the right hand side and being kind of loose with it. It doesn't have to be um, precise. And I'm grabbing more of the brilliant orange. And it's okay if you let some of that brilliant orange, like the brush strokes, show. You see how I have that like strong swoop? Yes. And then if you want it to kind of blend really well in the background, then I just take my one inch wash and just kind of like at that top and bottom, just kind of swoop it back and forth. Now I'm gonna grab a little bit of yellow ochre and introduce that to the party. Maybe that's a little bit too bright. So let's grab some more orange, go on top. Man, I'm so excited for fall. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and the same thing, I'm gonna take my one inch wash, just kind of blend. I kind of wanted this to feel like fuzzy, like maybe there's a lot of candles or jack-o'-lanterns in the background or something like that. Gotcha. And then now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna be like really um, a little bit more strong with my color. And we might have to come back to let this dry a little bit, but just taking some orange and maybe a tiny bit, let's take some yellow and some white. Now this is what I mean and we'll see it way more clearly when we get to the lighted portion of the pumpkin, is like we don't have a true yellow in this box. But even without the true yellow, because we know how to use our values, we can still communicate such strong lighting and warmth. But if you look at this color within, and you'll see it when we paint it, this is not yellow, this is a tan. Weird. But because we were able to execute our values clearly of a highlight, to a low light. Yeah, <laughs> we're going with it. We're going with it. We are communicating that light still, which is kind of amazing. But I, I want to acknowledge that it might be frustrating while you're painting it because when you put that color down, you're gonna be like, that's not yellow and you're probably gonna wanna mess with it. And I'm just asking you to kind of trust the process a little bit and allow the values to do the work for you. Okay. Now, when we get down here, I'm gonna grab more of this brown here, kind of fill that in. And then I'm gonna take a very strong swoop of brilliant orange and just kind of like that shape of the smile, reflect that back, just like that. 
just a swoop. It doesn't have to be anything more than that. You just want to make sure that it goes all the way to the edge of the paper. I'm kind of disappointed. I have seen you swoop five or six times and I haven't heard a whoosh yet. So. <laughs> okay, let's do one. All right. Then. I'm going to grab a little bit of yellow ochre and swoop. There it is. Let's do one more layer of brilliant orange. You might think I'm just saying this, but those swoops are actually better than the previous <laughs> ones. That's it mm -hmm. right there. I nailed it. It's the secret. Okay. That was step one and two. Good job. Now we're going to move on to step three. And this is where we're really going to utilize gouache in an interesting way, which is we're going to water it down and um, let the transparency of the white paper help in creating the values that we're trying to create. Okay. Okay. So I'm actually going to grab some clean water. I'm going to switch to my round six. And basically, I want to create a value change within the sections that go through the pumpkin. So I'm going to start with yellow ochre. And I'm going to add a lot of water to it. And that's because I want to create a barely there color. So on the very inside, like imagine the candle is right here in the middle. And wherever the light source is closest, that's where the value will be lightest. And then it transitions to a darker value from there. So our lightest value is going to be right in the inside of the eye. And it's just this barely there color. Okay. And now I'm going to grab a little bit more yellow ochre. And even more. And it's okay if you overlap the lines a little bit. And then, so I have a pretty hard line right here, which I kind of want to smooth out a little bit. So I'm just going to kind of work that area back and forth until that transition feels a little bit more like you can't tell where it starts and stops, you know? Yeah. Okay. So already it's like, oh, there's some light there, you know? We're going to do the same thing on the right hand side, starting with the lightest value right in that bottom left corner. And then grabbing a bit more paint each time. And then blending. Now let's say that you tried blending and you accidentally, and I'm gonna do it, you accidentally evened out everything and you don't have the value shift anymore. Instead, it's all one value. You can use your white and put that light back in. So I would just take my white and apply that to my transition to put it back in. Now there is a difference though. And I don't think one is better than the other. I liked that the transparency of it, I felt like it spoke a little bit stronger to the highlight, um, but you can use white too if you need to, just if you lose it, you know? Okay. We're gonna do the same thing with the nose. Now the nose is interesting because it essentially would be right in front of the candle. I'm imagining in my head. So I'm gonna just do a very light yellow ochre wash across the entire thing and not worry too much about, about the value change, okay? And then same thing over here, the lightest value is gonna be kind of right here and then it will kind of darken along the edges. Michael, did you have a favorite costume when you were younger? Um. I mean, I definitely had a least favorite. Okay, what's your least favorite? Well, I was I don't really remember it, but my mother has this picture of me when I was, I don't know, two or three. She dressed me up like a Dalmatian. Um, I guess 101 Dalmatians from Disney had come out very recently. And hated it. I hated the paint on my face. And there's just this classic picture my mom has of me bawling on Halloween with <laughs> Um, favorite. Uh, I think I was Darth Maul from Star Wars one year. And that oh, was really fun. yes. I remember when that came out and all 
of the costumes, I feel like, for Darth Maul. <laughs> my, uh, my parents are both kind of artistic, and my dad face-painted me that year. He did? And he really nailed it. I mean, it was spot on. That's awesome. Yeah. What about you? Sorry, I'm thinking about transitioning my values, so it's hard for me to be like, uh, costume, costume. There was this one year, well, I guess I shouldn't say one year, but I had this like red medieval dress that someone made me for something, probably my grandma. And it was just like red. It was just like a really pretty red dress. And I think I wore it like four times in a row and just <laughs> changed it. Like yeah. one year I was medieval. And then another year, I think I was um, uh, the devil's wife or something. Like anything that a red kind of... <laughs> Just any red hey, theme. I like this one. Hester this one. Prime. Yeah. <laughs> Scarlet A. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So that is part of step um, three. And now what we're going to do is we are going to do these edges here. And this is what is interesting too, because they're, um, we want it, we want their values to be darker than the cutout areas but lighter than the actual pumpkin itself because the candle is highlighting those more than it's highlighting the outside of the pumpkin. So this is where we're gonna really utilize our um, Brilliant Orange. And actually to make our Brilliant Orange a little bit like stronger, um, like deeper red, I'm gonna grab a tiny bit of violet. You don't want too much because that will actually like brown it out, but you see how it's giving it kind of like this reddish, richer color? Yes. Let's do a tiny bit more. You know how you can like dry out a gourd and they like turn to wood almost? Yeah. It'd be really cool. I wonder if you could do that with a pumpkin, like carve it like a jack-o'-lantern and then dry it like that. I don't know. I feel like we would have seen that. Pumpkins get very gross. They get moldy. I'm going to Google it. Okay. So I'm using this like brilliant orange and violet colored for the very corner here. And then I'm going to use just brilliant orange after that. So it's just like um, just the slightest hint of value. And if you need to switch to your two, because we're painting in a very tight area here, go for it. Now the nice thing about this project too is like, if you're worried about your painting feeling like geometric, this could be a hand carved pumpkin. It could be like maybe a child carved this pumpkin. It could be a little jagged and imperfect. So I don't want you to feel like you have to nail every detail of this. Now along the edges here, I added a tiny bit of yellow ochre to my orange. So the value shift within these cutouts is not crazy strong. It's actually very subtle, but it's still there. And when we pay attention to these very subtle shifts in what we're painting, that's how we can elevate it. The concepts stay the same from essentially from when you're a beginner to an intermediate to an advanced. We need to focus on value, right? Which to me is probably one of the most important concepts you learn but the attention to all of the at all of the pieces of the painting that have value i think is what takes your painting to the next level all right so the internet says you can dry those little teeny tiny pumpkins if you don't carve them okay um i don't think you could do a big one a big pumpkin but this is a fun fact what take it home with you listeners it says to put vaseline on the cut parts of your pumpkin and on the inside, and your carved pumpkin pumpkin will last way longer. Really? Yeah, because it like keeps the keeps it moist. Yeah, it keeps the moisture from evaporating out. Okay, and the last thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a tiny bit of my yellow ochre with white, and just do a little more highlight right here on this value transition. Because remember, this candle is still hitting the edges here. You know what else pumpkins remind me of? What? A pumpkin pasta that the best chef in the world, Chad, showed us. So there was this restaurant here in Hamilton when we first moved here, and it was called Blue Sage. And the chef there, his name is Chad, and he's amazing. He's one of our good friends. And um, 
he makes this pasta. Oh my gosh. Called pumpkin andouille. Yeah, yeah. How I many close enough? I don't know. I don't know. But it's essentially like the most fall pumpkin-y pasta dish that I've ever had. And it's one, it's like sweet but spicy and savory. Um, it's so good. And then one year he came back. So he, him and his family moved um, away. And so the restaurant is no longer here, which makes me so sad because it was really, really good. Um, but he came back to visit and Michael was like, please teach me this dish. <laughs> we cooked together in my kitchen. And he did. It was like an 80s montage. <laughs> he taught Michael how to cook it and now I get to eat it. And it's just <laughs> great. But I do wish he was back here. Chad, come back to us. Chad, come back. Okay, so basically I'm just doing the same exact thing, but on the right-hand side, the opposite side. And remember that, like, again, you can layer gouache. So if you need to clean up an edge, if, um, you, if it dries differently than you anticipated, like, you will have the opportunity to go back and make those adjustments. So don't feel like um, every single mark that you make is set in stone. Not when it comes to gouache. And honestly, even with watercolor, some people think that like you can't mess with it, but sometimes you can do little tricks that will adjust it enough that it's not really a problem anymore. I can okay. tell I didn't eat a sufficient breakfast because I'm like, what other pumpkin dishes do I like? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk more about food. It's like the worst thing in the world is when you go grocery shopping when you're hungry. Uh, yeah, my bank account thinks so too. And you just buy everything <laughs> and you're like, what was I thinking? You think that until you're hungry again, and then you love yourself. <laughs> like, thank you past me for buying all this food. So it's it's a kind of a repetitive structure that we're doing here. Um, so just kind of let yourself make the marks and just kind of zone out almost. And sometimes just an extra swipe of a strong, pure color can really make it go pop. So um, I'll probably, I'm gonna take my Brilliant Orange and like even on this first one, just like a little swoop over this highlight using just Brilliant Orange is gonna really like make that color feel so much stronger. Now we need to move down here. So I'm gonna start with that brilliant orange and a tiny bit of violet. Right here on the corner. You're turning violet, violet. <laughs> Little Willie. I love that movie. Yeah, it's a good one. I think the vintage, or not the vintage, the first. Oh yeah. Willy Wonka is just so much better. With Jane Wilder. Yeah. So good. Okay, let's grab some more. Let's just do pure brilliant orange now. Now, if you're, I kind of went on this big spiel about how like the values are gonna really show that it's glowing. And you might be looking at this and saying, I don't believe you, Sarah. Well, that's because we haven't put in the contrast yet. So we're not there yet. You might see it a little bit right now, but it's really gonna pop when we put in our pumpkin. Now what's funny about our pumpkin, and this is why our brains are tricky to us, is our, our brain is just like pumpkins are orange, but when they're in a dark room that's not lit, they're gonna be shadowed. And what is dark orange? It's brown. And so if you look at this pumpkin, the majority of it, the left-hand side, is like brown and black completely. And so one of the, you know, greatest pieces of advice I can give you as you're creating your own paintings and starting to go off on your own is to paint what you see and not what your brain tells you you think that you see. Because if that were the case, I would be very lost trying to paint this pumpkin because it would be like orange on orange on yellow, you know? I thought you're going to go a different direction. You're like, the greatest piece of advice I can give you is as you paint, contribute to your 401k. <laughs> Have a healthier time. <laughs> the greatest piece of advice I can give you. <laughs> funny. Okay. And I'm going to let that dry for a second. And remember that 
The other thing of when it comes to painting is that it's gonna inform you as you go. So we put in our values and we're like feeling good about it, but whenever we make any adjustments to our painting, like paint the actual pumpkin, it's gonna affect what we've already laid down. So it's always a good idea to check back into those areas and say, do those values feel good? Do I need an extra highlight? Do I need to make any adjustments? Right now I feel good, but it's possible I'm gonna have to go back in and say, oh, let's actually adjust this and leave room for that. That's part of the painting process. Okay, so now what we are going to do is we are going to move on to step four, and this is where we're gonna paint the entirety of the pumpkin. Now, because of the lighting that's happening here in this pumpkin, I decided to go for a pumpkin that focuses more on just the lighting aspect of it, and not necessarily, um, I didn't focus too hard on the sections of the pumpkin. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, if you want to add those, please feel free to just think about how when a pumpkin is ribbed, whenever that rib kind of goes in, you're going to have a darker value there because it's going away from you. Um, I chose not to focus on that because it would have been a nightmare to try and paint around the cutout portions, making sure the highlights match in a shadowed room with a lit up pumpkin inside. It was too much. It was too much. And I'm like, I don't have to do that. I'll just paint it how I want to paint it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I chose. Problem solved. Problem solved. Maybe this is more like one of those vintage um, paper mache pumpkins, you know? Mm -hmm. You know what that's I'm saying? That's exactly what I was thinking. This is most likely a vintage paper mache <laughs> pumpkin. <laughs> when I see this pumpkin, it's giving paper mache. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> now you know. I don't know if it's a thing, but I'm really willing it to be a thing right now. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna to move to my round 12 because again, this area is larger and I'm gonna make a brown, but this is what's tricky. I need the brown to be lighter than the black, but not, but not lighter than the cutouts. So you have to go like with this in between. So I'm doing um, brilliant orange with black for this part. And we're just gonna start putting color down and we're gonna see. So that is fine, but you can see the value with this and the value with this is actually not very different. They're different colors, but the values are actually very similar. And so in my mind, I think, okay, I gotta go a little bit darker in my value. There we go, that feels better. And then how can we tell if it's light enough against the background? Well, let's paint up to the edge and see if we can see that difference. Now, I will say that on the left-hand side, specifically because it's shadowed, that is almost gonna blend into the background. That is gonna be like its darkest dark. So it's okay if you lose some of that edge, but then as we move kind of more across and the highlighted areas, we wanna make sure that that edge is seen. Now, as someone who is a watercolorist, you're gonna have the urge to keep dipping your paint, your paintbrush in your water, which is not bad. You just have to remember that when you do that, it's gonna thin out your paint, which is gonna just make it a lighter value, just similar to like the same way watercolor is, and it's gonna make it transparent. And there is a difference between opaque and transparent on your painting, like you will be able to like actually see the difference between the two. And it could get to a point that it almost is distracting. Um, so just kind of be aware of that. So here I'm taking a lot of my brown and black and going really dark. If it starts to feel too gluey, that's how I know I need to add a little bit of moisture to my brush and thin it out. Like if the paint isn't moving for me and it feels very sticky, I'm like, okay, let's smooth it a little bit with some water. Okay, rewind to the very beginning when we were trying to think of the word for the brush getting dry. Yeah. How about jittery? Jittery. I like that. Yeah, that took all episode to think of. <laughs> and kind of carefully work around these cutouts. Okay. 
Now, essentially, when we're looking at the value transition across this pumpkin, it's gonna go from dark value to light value. So over here, we get more of the orange, and over here, we stay within the browns and the blacks. So that's essentially what I'm just putting in now is that value transition. And then we'll go through in the next step and kind of like smooth everything out, put in some texture, put in some highlights, but we're really just trying to get the hint of the values here or the um, like value underpainting, I guess. We're at that part of the episode, which happens almost every episode where I go, no way this turns into that, <laughs> you know? Are you there? I'm there right now. <laughs> Like, this is not a pumpkin, but I have faith. Good. I have faith in me. I learned. So I'm still using my 12. Still using kind of this brown. This is like pure brown, I would say. And then about right here is where I'm going to start introducing more orange. Honestly, squaring up these little teeth are tricky. You might want to use a smaller brush. Would that be perfect for that big square brush, or is that the wrong thing? Mm, I would say those squares are too small to utilize that squareness. Got you. So as you can see, I'm grabbing more orange. Orange. I actually might switch my six just for this kind of area where there's a lot of cutouts. Now, if you accidentally, you can always adjust the size of your cutouts. Let's say you like cut off a corner. That's fine. You can always make them a little bit smaller or you can always go back in with a white, with the brilliant orange, put that highlight back in and you're good to go. So I kept painting with my six and I should have switched back to my 12 because just look how much easier it is to fill a whole area with that. Now this kind of tooth poking out here is gonna still be pretty dark because it's silhouetted against the candle. And sometimes I like to just kind of block the color in and then I'll go back with a smaller brush and really tighten up the shapes of these things, the edges, I guess. You ready to hear one of the weirdest sentences ever out of my mouth? Yeah. I was thinking a lot about candle makers recently. Okay. <laughs> there it is. But um, I bet back, you know, late 1800s and previous candle maker, there were a lot of candle makers because like, I think a lot of people used candles. Mm -hmm. So you just had to get them all the time, buy them all the time. It's kind of a profession that's turned into just hobby at this point, you know? Yeah. Weird. Yeah. I feel like a lot of things, we actually were watching a documentary about food last night. Mm -hmm. And that was the same kind of thing with bread and cooking in, in of itself is there are a lot of things that were a necessity. And now there's a lot of um, advances that make it. So we don't really, you know, we don't need candles, so the art of candle making is lost. We have so many options when it comes to food that sometimes the, I mean, like, I don't know how to make bread. Michael knows how to make bread, and he's an excellent bread maker, but, like, that's not a skill that I have. Yeah, they were saying in that show that the average American spends 27 minutes a day average cooking. So, like, all three meals combined, 27 minutes, which is so quick. Yeah. Yeah, that was crazy. I think it was just called Cooked, honestly, is on Netflix. I think so, too. Yeah. Okay, so now we're getting towards the top of the pumpkin, and this is where it little gets a little bit confusing because you're like, what part, what is but This front part that's right in front of the stem is going to be highlighted, and the part behind the stem is going to be shadowed a little bit more, but then a little bit of light. So it, we have to show that it's like a divot, 
And so we need that highlight along the top. So I'm gonna use Brilliant Orange. Now my brush is kind of muddy right now. I have a lot of other like browns and blacks on it and that's okay because I'm kind of just laying down the values. And after it dries, we can always go back with kind of a cleaner brush and, and soften or like kind of lighten it up. And then I'm also kind of starting to focus on the form of the pumpkin. I haven't really been focusing on that so much where my brush stroke has been more horizontal. And at this point, I wanna say, I wanna make sure that not only are my brush strokes vertical, but they're rounded as if I'm painting on top of the form itself. So we can give the viewer the idea of the shape of it, the form of it, okay? Let's go ahead with a bright, brilliant orange here. I'm already past my disbelief phase. It looks like <laughs> a pumpkin. That was the quickest transition ever. <laughs> And this is why I love this Brilliant Orange so much because when you use it, it gives the illusion that it's that there's warmth. Like I feel like not only is this highlighted, but you can get a sense of the light coming through from the inside because it's such a strong orange. You and mean light brown? <laughs> yes, orange, AKA light brown. <laughs> and then let's actually give a little bit of that curvedness here. I've carved pumpkins every year of my life. It's a family tradition, and mm -hmm. I am still just awful at it. Me too. I really thought that since I have artistic <laughs> ability that I would be good at carving pumpkins. No, it is not a skill I possess. Me and my 11-year-old Ella decided to go on YouTube and look at, like, good pumpkin carvings. People are ridiculous so good. yes yeah oh my gosh and i love that don't you love that there could be someone you don't know that's like oh joe from work hey joe what's going on and then you see his carved pumpkin and you're like joe from work joe from work you're so good at carving <laughs> pumpkins i just love that i love it when people surprise you with these like hidden talents that you're like how did, how did that even happen okay so now i'm gonna put in a little bit of highlight over here and I'm okay with this staying really dark because again, this is shadowed and we're gonna see how everything dries. So I might need to make some adjustments later, but for now I'm feeling really good about it. And then let's take my 12 and grab some of this dark brown again. And if you need to wait a second to let this dry before you try and put in this kind of like darker area, you can. I'm feeling edgy, so I'm just gonna go for it. Fall is so funny to me because, you know, you romanticize every season you're not in. Mm -hmm. Missouri in the summer is hot and humid and green and jungly. And you're like, this is like this all the time. Mm -hmm. And then the winter here is barren landscape, frozen, frozen tundra. With red cardinals. It's beautiful. And then you're just like, this is my life now. But yeah. it just goes back and forth. Fall is fun because it's just like, I don't know, bridging that gap. Yes. It is kind of funny with living in a place that has such different strengths of seasons, like their seasons are strong, Holy whatever God. one that you're in. Yeah. And I remember like when it's so cold, like the ground is frozen that you literally can't drive outside. Yeah. It's like funny thinking, I, 4th of July, it was a hundred degrees at, you oh, know, at night. 11 o'clock yeah. at night. <laughs> it is so good. I mean, you guys at home, it gets negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit here. Yeah. And it also gets 100 degrees with 90% humidity here. Yeah, it's pretty extreme. It's wild. Okay, and you can paint into your stem a little bit. Because, again, we're trying to avoid any gaps. Okay, so that is feeling pretty good. I'm going to let my eyes take a break from looking at my pumpkin and moving on to my stem. It's always a good idea to let your eyes rest if you're painting one area over and over, your eyes become tired and it becomes really difficult to actually see what you've done. So let it dry, give your eyes a break and move on to a different part of the painting and then come back to it and see what it needs. So I'm gonna move to the stem. Now the tricky thing is our stem is brown and we've essentially just been painting in browns the whole time. So it's just like, how can I make this stem feel a little bit different? So I decided to try using turquoise in my brown. And even though it's not gonna create a huge difference, sometimes it's just like knowing that I use a little bit of a different color <laughs> helps me be like, no, it's a different brown. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take some turquoise blue. Let's take some orange and that's gonna give it kind of like a brown, but more like a green brown or a gray brown than a red brown. 
that makes sense. That feels good. It's also weird, follows the transition to this, but like, it's dark all the time. You know when you have to wake up for school to get the kids up? Oh, like, yes. It's dark till mid-morning, and then it gets dark at 5 p.m. Yeah. Crazy. Okay, so with this brown, I'm going to put in some white, and I'm going to put in some yellow. And let's just see where that brown takes us. I'm chatty, and you're trying to work. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> and some orange. Okay, that feels like a different brown to me, and that feels good. Now, the reason why I want it to be a light brown is because I wanted to show, like, the texture on these stems is actually very... I don't like pumpkin stems. They're like rough. Sandpapery. Kind Sandpapery. Of. And so I kind of want to show that. So I'm going to do a light value brown, and then I'll take a dark brown on top of it and kind of do some dry brush textures to give it kind of that like feeling of like roughness and unevenness and things like that. We should give our pumpkins hats. We should have like wizard hat or like a little sombrero or something. Yes. Okay. So that feels good. Do you see how that brown is different than the other ones? It's sticking out a lot right now, but when we put that dark value on top, it's going to feel better. Okay. Um, so we're going to let that dry for a second. And now um, we're going to move on to our last step. And this is where we're going to just kind of sharpen everything, adjust whatever we need to adjust, add some textures and just some finishing details. Okay. So I'm going to give that a break. I am going to put the highlight in front of that stem. So I'm going to take some brilliant orange and just kind of swoop right here, right on top. So you see how like all of a sudden that's in front. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to move some of this color down. That orange is so good. Is it good? It's a good orange. I say it's brilliant. <laughs> And then let's say like some of that orange is just too strong. You can always like tone it down with maybe a little bit of the ochre. It just kind of softens it while also still keeping its warmth. And this is where I'm gonna be okay with the brush stroke being a bit jittery because that's what we decided, right? Yes, For that word. jittery. Jittery. Because I think it gives hint to uh, the texture of the pumpkin. In art school, do they give you like survival paint lessons? Like if you're stuck in the wilderness, this is how you make blue. <laughs> no, but I wish. <laughs> survival painting. No, they do not do that. Yeah, art school is really interesting. I really, I mean, I'm obviously I'm really glad that I went. I learned a lot. Um, but some people, especially if people are interested in having like careers, as an artist, they think like, do you have to go to art school? And honestly, what art school gets you is two things. It's a commitment to actually creating, which is in and of itself, the most important thing. You have to commit to your, to your practice and your craft if you want to improve, if you wanna be able to paint what it is that you wanna make. The other thing is a community in which that you have people that you trust that will look at your painting and tell you what it needs. And there's no, I mean, like it takes time but you trust these people that when they say this feels flat or I don't know, this doesn't seem as strong as your other ones, you're not offended. And um, that's hard to find. It's hard to find that. Um, and I think like art school in and of itself does those two things really well, as well as teaching like terms and stuff like that. I don't want to undervalue that, that part. But. I was going to say as an outsider's opinion, because I kind of went to art school vicariously through you. We went to college at the same time mm -hmm. and we were married. This is piggybacking on what you said, but I learned that art school teaches you how to take criticism so well. It teaches you about vulnerability. Yeah. And yeah, criticism. You're better at it than I am. I Where... get defensive. <laughs> well, I wasn't always good at it, but again, it's that. And I'm just using my round two and sharpening up. Um, my teeth and kind of like my edges on things. If you have three teeth, they're called teeth. Teeth. <laughs> Sorry, keep That's going. a technical. Keep going. Uh, 
Yeah, it wasn't always that because whenever people criticize your work, it's always hard because because it's it's vulnerable to create something. I don't care what created. It's vulnerable to make bread. It's vulnerable to sing a song. It's vulnerable to dance. Um, and so then when people have feelings about that, that's hard. But then you get to this aspect where you learn how to separate your value from what you make, which is really, really hard to do. And even with this, I mean, I love my job. I love being able to teach you guys. It's so great. Um, but it's really hard not to base my value on what it is that I make and what you are interested in learning from me and all of that kind of stuff. But the problem is, is if you hold all of that to what it is that you make and totally define yourself from not only what you make, but how other people feel about what you make is you will never make again because you're terrified. And I don't care if it's successful or a failure. If it's a failure, failure, you'll probably stop sooner because it's scary. If it's successful, that actually increases pressure too. And you're just like, what if this one is not successful? What if I lose what I have with these people? Um, and so, but I think that comes along with how much you make. And that's why art school is nice is because you're, you're making at such a pace um, that you're just like, yeah, that painting didn't work out, but I'm going to do another one. So it actually is okay. And I want you guys to feel that way with your paintings with me is some of them might not turn out. Some of them you might look and be like, what the heck is happening here? And you laugh at yourself and you move on because it's just a piece of paper. Um, and when you, when you hold so tightly to it, that you stop making because one thing didn't turn out. That's the biggest, what's the word? Heartbreak. Heartbreak. Because you're not giving yourself to make the opportunity to make the favorite thing, you know, the thing you're most proud of. And the more that you make, the more that you have that opportunity to make something that you're most proud of. Okay. So how are things looking here? I'm going to tighten up some of my eyes, shapes here. Luckily for you, you skipped all of that pressure and you just went into the public painting and no one's ever critical. So <laughs> it's perfect. Lucky for me, I skipped all of that. Yeah. No. <laughs> And sometimes just making sure you have a strong, like straight edge is really, can really like be like, oh, yeah. Okay. Let's adjust this edge. Now, the tricky thing about adjusting edges is the the values around the eyes are different depending on which eye that you're painting. So just make sure that you're looking at that and matching the values. And I think what I'm gonna do, I feel happy here. I kind of want a little bit more yellow ochre in the mouth along these edges here. Which, uh, which classical art style would you call this pumpkin? <laughs> I don't know. It's post-impressionism for sure. I do not know. <laughs> Sometimes I feel very like, oh yeah, I, I know art history. And then other times I'm like, I know nothing. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> and the fun thing too with this like pumpkin carving is you could do any expression you want. Like I just did kind of a... a the smile, but like you can turn this into angry. You can turn this into, I don't know. You can totally just change the whole feeling of this painting depending on the expression on this jack-o'-lantern. Okay, and I think my values actually got a little too light right here. So I'm gonna take some brown. 
tone those down. Okay, and then let's take some dark brown. I'm gonna grab a little bit of violet and add that to this tan mixture. Now, just so you guys know, gouache is reconstitutable. If it dries, you can paint with it again. I will say though that it's actually really tricky to control the like opaqueness when you um, do that. So like, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's also not the easiest way to use gouache. Okay, and then I'm gonna take my six. I want this to be even darker. It's kind of like leftover food. It's yes. free, it's edible again, but it's never the same. It's never the same. It's not the same. But you still can use it. I prefer to use gouache straight out of the tube. But if you're just doing like a background or an underpainting or whatever, then like you can bring it back. Okay, so now that I got the brown I want, I'm going to dry off my brush. So then it gets kind of like that jittery. I'm just going to put kind of like uneven lines on there to get that texture. And I might do a little hint of yellow ochre around the edges of this nose because it's reading maybe a little bit too white. You see that? Mm -hmm. And this is what I mean, like when we put in these values originally, they seemed dark enough. And then once you paint like black or brown next to it, all of a sudden those values like almost look white. And then you're like, oh shoot. Looks like one of those eye tricks where it's like, this is the same color. Yeah. And it's on a black background and a white background. You're like, there's no way. And then they touch each other and you're like, they are the same color. Yes. I love those. Yeah. Okay, and then for that extra hint, this is gonna be, I'm feeling really good about my pumpkin. I think he looks great. Um, but the last thing to give like the strongest hint of warmth is I'm gonna take pure brilliant orange and my round two, and I'm actually going to go along the edges of this eye. And it's just going to give us that extra pop, that extra feeling that there is a light coming out. But it's really hard to paint. <laughs> really thin lines. There we go. Just do your best. I like to think that these pumpkin antennas on top of your head are helping you receive <laughs> fall vibes. Yes. It's like capturing the fall in the air mm -hmm. and condensing it to your head. Yes. And then if you want your pumpkin to be like more smiley, then you would just like make your curve go like really up and tight into a really tight, like thin curve. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. And this is why water uh, gouache is really cool is I can just layer right on top of that black. feels pretty good. I'm wondering if, do you think that's too bright? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I didn't want to say it, but the whole time I was like, I want a little bit of dark over that. I'm just going to take the yellow ochre and water it down so it's thinned out. So then I'm just softening the orange and not totally covering it up. Maybe I'll do the top, the same thing on this top. Yeah, that feels so much better.
And again, I'm starting to pay attention to the curve of the, the pumpkin as I do this. And I think that highlight in there is a little bit too strong too, so I'm just gonna tone that. And maybe this bottom here needs one more swoop. Brilliant orange. Whoosh. Okay. I think we're I think we're done. It's done. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> okay. But this is the best part. Because sometimes paintings are like, mm. and then you reveal the clean edge. And you're like, oh, <laughs> that looks really good. <laughs> So when you remove tape, you want to do it slowly and you want to pull it away from your paper, like so. And the tape type matters. And the tape type does matter. In all of my painting years, the best tape I have found is Holbein Soft Tape. It is not sold everywhere though. It's actually kind of hard to find. I know we carry it at Let's Make Art, but besides that, I'm not sure who carries it. Um, but it is by far the best um, tape I have found for watercolors and gouache. You don't want to be using scotch tape, duct tape. Look at that. Clean lines. Isn't that cool? Yes. And this is just such a fun um, seasonal painting. I hope you guys had a great time painting it. I know this one was a little bit longer, but gosh, look at the glow. Look at that light feel that you got in that pumpkin. And again, I wanna emphasize, we did not have a true yellow. We were able to utilize values and do a value shift to really create that sense of warmth and light because yellow ochre is like more of a tan. So good job. And I hope that that shows to you that it is important to take the time to understand and see values because that is what is gonna give your painting the feeling of light, um, the feeling of warmth and the feeling of form. Well, Thank you so much for painting with me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and thank you for taking the time for your creativity and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.